Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. So we are here for Deploy Studio this morning, up and running in 60 minutes. And I certainly hope this is true. We are going to attempt to get everyone setting up Deploy Studio on their laptops and netbooting with your partners, if you have a partner. And if not, we can just throw some IPs up and we'll figure it out later. But anyway, we're going to start with a quick walkthrough of Deploy Studio's startup. Would you mind? There you go. Next slide, please. Yes, so installation. We have some links here. This is where we download our installers for Deploy Studio. Some people like to use the last, last stable version. Some people like to use the nightly version. It depends on what you're doing. Testing environments, you may want the night, latest nightly. Production, you may want the stable version. And if the latest nightly fixes something that you need desperately, you might just run that in production. So pre-configuration for Deploy Studio. The first thing you need is an AFP or SMB or NFS, I believe, or CIFS share. In most cases, I just use the AFP share off a single server. We're going to make this as easy as possible. We imagine that you've just bought a Mac mini server. You've just installed it into your network. Someone else has handled DNS and DHCP. All you have to worry about is installing server and Deploy Studio. So we set up an AFP share. We share the folder. You can do this with server.app, or you can do this with get info on the finder. You install the Deploy Studio DMG, install the package that's inside of it, and then you open <laughs> the Deploy Studio Assistant. Applications, Utilities, Deploy Studio Assistant. And this is where we'll switch from slides to hands-on. Yoink. Okay, let me get rid of this. And you can ignore that for right now. So, let's follow along. Everyone should have Deploy Studio DMG on their desktop. Anyone does not? Uh-oh. Okay. So let's open up that disk image. We've got our, um, so this is an OS 10 7.3 install, client install with server installed on top of it. We're pretending that's all we've done so far. Now we're installing Deploy Studio Server. So when you mount the disk image, you'll see that. Mac, M-A-C, lowercase. Mac. Mac, Mac. And as any other package, continue, continue, agree, install. You are giving away your firstborn child in this just. <laughs> And if you are the only firstborn, I apologize. So Deploy Studio is a fairly small install. Finishes quite quickly. <laughs> I shouldn't say those things yet, should I? OK. So Deploy Studio is successfully installed. At this point, you have no Deploy Studio server running. It is just installed, ready for you to tell it what to do. Has everyone installed it? Anyone not installed it? Yes, sir. Am I installing this on my server, or am I installing this on my, both my client machine? I start on server. OK, so I'm doing this on server first. So the, the question was, do we install this on server or client first? That's a very good question. This is your server first. What I, what I like to do is I like to get it set up and working on my server. And once I've done that, I can take the Deploy Studio installer and install the admin interface on my admin machine or client machine. And then from that machine, I can connect to the server. But right now, we're just focusing straight on the server. You've only got one machine you're running Deploy Studio on. One thing to note with questions with that, Deploy Studio in itself doesn't actually really have a client utility. There's, when you deploy an image, there's nothing that actually needs to be on your image when it goes out. You can put the admin on there, which will give you some other tools, but it doesn't need to be there to use Deploy Studio on your final deployed image. Or the runtime. So. Everyone have Deploy Studio and Min, Deploy Studio Assistant, and Deploy Studio Runtime. Applications, Utilities, Deploy Studio Runtime. Assistant, sorry, Assistant. That's what we want to open up next. Does this equally have 
Yes. yes. Oh, 10 I think as of uh, RC14 or something like that, it's in the release notes. It no longer supports anything previous to 10.5. So I think 10.5 is the latest or the oldest that you can run this on. OK, any questions? OK, so do we all have a, does anyone not have the assistant open? The first message we see is, hey, the Deploy Studio server is not running on this computer. Do you want to start it? Yes, please start it. This is our server. Let's start that thing. OK, so as the Deploy Studio server starts, what it's actually doing is basically setting up a web server. Um, this web server hosts out the information that the Deploy Studio client needs to talk to, uh, to run workflows, and et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So after we've started our server, what we want to do next is we want to set up the Deploy Studio server. So right now it's running, but it doesn't actually know what to do. Just saying, hey. So let's say, continue. Um, the server address. This is going to be the IP of your server or the host name of your server. If it's easier to use host name, do it that way. If it's easier to use the IP, that's fine as well. This is just to connect to the server. This won't go out to your clients. Won't be part of your netboot set. Just as a, a side note, right now it's actually picking up my Deploy Studio server. So you got to change DS server local to localhost. Yeah, it uses Bonjour to try and find Deploy Studio servers on the network. So if you have more than one, it'll list it. And right. So that's why it found his right now. Oh, crap. I should have turned that off. OK, so you're going to have to change a couple things. First of all, uh, you guys don't have HTTPS installed yet. So the actual address is going to be uh, 60080 and get rid of the S and HTTP. Yes. Sorry about that. OK, so our server address for your machine, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost, colon, 680. Deploy Studio likes to run over two ports, 680 and 60, 443 for SSL. More about SSL later. Pretty much. Yep. Or 60 or 60, 100, yeah. yeah. So the username for you will be Mac, and the password will be Mac, the local admin account of the server. Yes, that's required. Um, this is. For you guys, it's just Mac, Mac. OK, Mac, OK. Mac, Mac, everyone at this screen? OK. You're still uh, at the local host screen? Just type Mac. It's kind of like a gray background. There you go. Question? There you go. Okay, anyone not at the screen still? Three? Okay. Continues not continuing. Ah, too many deploy studio servers. Oh, you gotta add uh, it's a local. Um, oh, it's pinwheeled. Oh, help you out for a second. We're just gonna force quit. Ignore. We're gonna try again. So continue. And then what you're gonna do is type in HTTP. Local. So I can't spell local. <laughs> local host, and then it's port 600. Did you guys get to the screen? Okay. And go ahead and type Mac, tab Mac. There you go. So Everybody on that side called up? Is anyone not on the, the screen right now where you okay. can select master or replica? Anyone not here? OK, let's move on. So we, we're going to set up a master today. I'm not really wanting to get into replicas and things, because I just want to keep this as a single Deploy Studio server. If you have questions about replicas, you can find us afterwards or while we're doing some uh, uh, hands-on work later. So when we set up a master, we have to tell it where we want our repository to be stored. That was the step that we did before to set up the AFP server, that folder that had to be shared. Um, unless you're running Deploy Studio off of a single bootable hard drive, 
then in most cases, you're going to want a networked repository so that when you netboot clients or you install the assistant on another client that's booted into the OS, it will be able to find that network repository when it connects you to Poi Studio and Min server. So we'll choose a network SharePoint and hit continue. And at this point, we will switch back to the finder because no one, no one has a shared folder yet. So we have to make one. So on your desktop, make a new folder. It does not matter what you call it. Personally, I prefer capital D, capital S. I put it in the root of the volume, but whatever. That's, it, that's where I, like, for an actual server setup, that's where I put it. <laughs> yeah, I don't put it on a user's desktop, but. <laughs> That'd be easier to connect. Yeah, my server, yeah. where I'm, where I work, it, we actually have a, I keep Deploy Studio on a separate volume. So, yeah. in that volume, I just have a, one folder called Deploy Studio, and, and that's what that reference is. Right. Yeah, yep. I've got a, 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 my previous job, I had a Fiber RAID. That's where we kept our repository. And you don't have to keep the repository on the same machine. For easiness, we're just going to do the same machine today. So it shouldn't matter where your, ho where your, your repository folder is, because the share is going to be the same. Uh, you can drag it to the desktop or the root. Anyway, you want to get permission or get info on that folder and dr open up the sharing and permissions folder. Make sure you have rewrite access to it and click shared folder. For you guys, it should pop up with a thing to enable file sharing. Go ahead and just click enable, and then Mac Mac to log to authenticate. Yeah, you want to click shared oh, folder. Just there. go ahead. Yeah, that's all Mac set. Just go ahead and do uh, shared folder. And then click shared folder. Yes. And then if it asks you to enable file sharing, go ahead and enable it. Okay, so did everyone get the shared folder? Anyone Better question, does anyone not have the shared folder? <laughs> I need to start asking like that. Okay. Got it? Okay. Now, we'll go back to the Deploy Studio Assistant and we can tell it that we are looking at an AFP share. It is on our... Do you want to call the repository? You want the IP of the machine? Yeah. 127. Yeah, no, 192.168. Dot two. We have to put the fully qualified domain name or correct IP address of the Deploy Studio server here. We can't use local host. And the reason is, is because when you start, uh, when you log into the Deploy Studio server with the, with the runtime, it needs to know that address for the repository because it's going to mount it. It's going to mount this folder and it's going to run uh, images or packages or scripts from this repository. Right, so for you guys, this is going to either need to be your personal Mac's IP address or your personal Mac's local Oops. host name. So Macintosh dash number dot local or the actual IP address, which I, you guys can find going up to the Wi-Fi settings, network preferences, whatever. I think the IP is going to be the easiest for us right now because the host names are a little wonky. Yeah. Well, but you can still get to network preferences from the yeah. Wi-Fi. So 192.168.2. Dot last octet of your IP. And that's what we'll put in as our URL for our file share. And then a forward slash and the name of the folder that you shared out. Thank you. Doop, doop, doop. No, just the AFP path. So whatever your share name was. So for you, it's DS test. Yeah, when you create that share, what, to connect to that share, you use your, the, fo the host name of the machine, the IP address of the machine, with the forward slash and the name of the folder. You don't have to That'll have the full Mac path Mac. to the folder. Yep. That's correct. No, you do not want the full path to the folder. The, what the, when you connect to the server, it sees that as the share. It doesn't actually matter where on the system it is. It sees that as a share. Question? One thing to note is AFP is case sensitive. So if you use capital DS, you don't want to put lowercase DS in here. It is one of the few that's case sensitive. Thank you. I did not know that. It's actually not AFP that's case sensitive. It's the URL well, that's case sensitive. It's sort of a little... 
Yeah, when you actually type the full URL in, it sends it that way. Okay, so does anyone not have their URL? Okay, the username and password that we connect with the file share can be different from the username and password you've used with your Deploy Studio admin, but in this case, we're using the same Mac user, Mac password. And we'll, we'll not touch any of the subfolder or mount options. What, what they, what, oh, um, if you want to use a subfolder within the share as a repository, you can give the path to that subfolder. So if I had a, let's say I have a, an, uh, a folder called um, software, and then inside that folder, I, w I want another folder just for the repository. So I have all my software and then the repository. That would be a subfolder within the share. Um, advanced parameters. I, honestly, I've never used any of those advanced options, subfolder advanced parameters. But I believe the advanced, or I'm sorry, the mount options would be for uh, using AFP or CIFS if you want to pass any options while you're mounting. Has anyone used those? Nope. Okay. I think it also comes into play with NFS, like if you want to tweak the window sizes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So let's say continue. And this is the notification screen. Has anyone, does anyone not have the notification screen up? I'm sorry, is it called notification? What's that? Access error. <laughs> so get info on your folder. Let's see, okay, so your root URL, you need to add the folder name to the end, forward slash. Okay, now try and continue there. Perfect, anyone else? Okay, so notifications. Um, email notifications, they're pretty cool. Uh, I had those when I was running Deploy Studio as an admin, and when I had a technician go out, if they reinstalled the OS or installed a piece of software, I would get a notification. So I would know where, what's happening on the Deploy Studio server. I also used Deploy Studio for self-service, so staff and students could install their own software. And when they installed software, I got a notification. It told me that they installed Office or whatever, so I could keep track of licenses if needed. Uh, we're not gonna enable it today. Firstly, because I don't really want to troubleshoot sending an email from this subnet, since it's a a private network, we're just gonna let it go. But I suggest that you do take a look at it, enable it, and at any point you wanna change any of these options, you run the Deploy Studio Assistant again and step through these panes and just change whatever you want and it updates the server. It's very easy, you can run through this as many times as you want. It, it'll, yes, correct, yes. One thing to note about the notifications, if you image 100 machines, you're going to get 100 emails. And yeah. so on, so on. I recommend turning it on for only failures. The successes kind of get annoying after a while. So either that or have some really good filters on your, your mail server or mail client. For my own setup, I have uh, the email notifications turned on. I also have an email rule set to automatically mark them red and route them to a particular folder, and I just check them later. Is anyone not on the SSL screen? Good. So. Deploy Studio, when you install it, installs a basic SSL certificate. Why not use it? I say turn on SSL. Use the com.deploystudio.server certificate. You can use your own if you'd like, but this is free. It gets installed with Deploy Studio server, and when you're setting this stuff up, you're, you're probably just setting it up to run it the first time and test and see what's gonna happen. So in the future, if you get a certificate, you can change that later. Um, HTTPS is just more secure. It's better to have, I think, over just a standard HTTP. If you're pushing any plain, uh, plain text scripts or packages, anything that would bind or have a binding password, this is doubly or triply important. And the binding scripts do have passwords in plain text. Yes. Are plain text or uh, a uh, reversible sh hash? Reversible hash. Maybe they moved it to reversible hash it's, now. Yeah. I forget what it was, but yeah. It's reversible, but it's still not that great. Anyway, um, the, the last checkbox there is rejecting unknown computers. The Ploy Studio has a computer's database where it'll keep a list of all the machines that it's seen. You can also import your own list of machines. So if you only want people in your database to, to uh, access the Ploy Studio server, you can reject those un unknown machines. 
A, a good note with this is if you have, uh, we'll just say a, a computer lab, you can have all of these computers <laughs> netboot into Deploy Studio. It'll populate the database for you, and then you can go through this assistant again and check that box so that only this lab can talk to that Deploy Studio server. It, it's a lot faster than typing in MAC addresses and whatnot. <laughs> That's correct. So when we first connected to the Deploy Studio server to initially set it up, we had to connect over port 680 because that's all it was running on. Once we set it to change to 443, any future re uh, requests to connect to the server through the admin or runtime will require us to point to that 443 HTTPS address. And really what we're going to do is we're going to set that address into the netboot set that we create. So it will always when we create the netboot set and you netboot a machine, it'll always look for that IP address or host name. And in the future, you can just use the 443 HTTPS. So, continue. Anyone not at the groups page? So, with, with the Poi Studio, you can have different groups access to different parts of the suite. For what the ad assistant setup, which is what we're in right now, I lock that down to admin groups. If you're the only person using the Deploy Studio server, all three groups can be admin. And this will be the easiest setup. This will work with Open Directory and Active Directory groups if your server is bound to Active Directory or Open Directory. Thank you. Yep. yep. Um, I believe you can also create groups within the system preferences, and they'll show up as well. So any directory service that you bound your server to, I did this with AD, we used AD groups. I'm sorry, not we used AD users inside OD groups and gave the OD groups access to uh, the runtime. And the runtime is probably the only thing you want other people to have access to. You may have some other technicians in the department that you don't want to share the local admin password with. If everyone has an admin account through AD and they're bound, you can use another group to set the administrators. So right now, if everyone has admin, 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 let's hit continue. One anyone... thing, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say one thing to note with the groups, if you mistype it and you put the wrong group in, you'll lock yourself out. I have a, another note on that is we have a lot of objects in our Active Directory, uh, a lot of uh, group objects um, even. So one of the things I did to make it easier for my environment is I actually created local groups in the local directory service and then nested the AD groups in those local groups. Because um, when I tried to type in the AD groups into that box, they weren't even being found because there's just so many of them. So it's, for me, it was easier to create four local groups and then nest AD groups in it. And also, it's uh, to make your lives easier, if you have like an admin group and then like a users group, it's always beneficial to nest the admin group inside the user group so that you guys can, because you only get one group option. Once you guys see the workflows and the access groups and stuff like that, you can only set one group as for access. So if you want the users to see it and the admins to see it, you have to make sure your admins are in the user group so that, you know, that nesting works properly. And we'll show you that later, I think. For more about group nesting, see Nathan. So multicast, is Beth in here? There's only one person at this conference I've talked to who got multicasting working. Anyone in here ever use multicasting? Uh, we were, Brandon, um, she said that yesterday that it would take about a day and a half to image a lab of 25 machines using unicast, which is where each machine pulls the image down directly, versus multicast would take her a few hours to image a lab because multicast continuously pushes that image out. And when machines start, they grab whatever point is being pushed out and then cycle around until they get all the packets or all the blocks. Question? You have multicast working? Cool. You do too? Great. Great. Good speed increases between unicast. So if you need that speed, check out multicasting. Yes? Is there an issue on over multicasting over wireless? Multicasting over wireless? I've never tried it. I would assume it depends, it, just like multicast in general, how the network's set up. If you actually have the multicast snooping and all that kind of stuff on the access point configured correctly, it should work. To quote Alistair, your mileage may vary. Yeah. How do you go about uh, tweaking these settings to kind of get multicasting working? Because I've never. Please contact your network administrator to help you find out the best configuration. <laughs> Yeah. 
I think there's also Bombic had a guide with mm -hmm. NetRestore, I think, on how to tweak uh, multicast to go through and find out what your best settings are. Because all this uses is ASR. So there's some testing stuff with an ASR that you can use to find out what your best settings are. I used to know and I forget. Um, I feel like there used to be a box to turn that off with multicasting. Because it it, I don't see like an enable it's, disable. When you deploy the image, it's whether you tell it to go via multicast or not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we'll just ignore this page and continue on. Um, Honestly, if you don't check the workflow to use multicast, it's not even going to attempt to. So you can just skip. If you're not going to use multicast, you can just, like your installer, continue to continue. Yeah. That uh, allow box is just if you end up having, like, say, if you offer this to a group of technicians and say you have four different groups and you only specify that two multicasts <coughs> can run, if you have all four groups trying to do 25 machine needs, only two will work because it'll only allow up to that many streams going out. Okay. So is anyone not at the screen? Okay, let's apply our settings. Yay! Questions? You mentioned earlier that if you rerun the assistant, um, all the old settings will just propagate itself and you can make changes as needed. Yep. Is that also true if you're upgrading the version of the Deploy Studio? Yes, sir. Great. <laughs> uh, expect it. Yes, expect the unexpected. <laughs> I applied um, the settings. It's yeah. okay. If you get an yeah, unexpected quit, I would run through them again. Just continue, continue again. Contact your local mission. <laughs> um, if you get back to this screen, you can close the Deploy Studio Assistant. You have now set up your Deploy Studio server. You got it all? Or do you want? To prove to you that you've set up a Deploy Studio server, Open the Deploy Studio Admin. Applications Utilities, Deploy Studio Admin. And type in HTTPS, colon, forward slash, forward slash, localhost, or 127.0.0.1, or 192.168.2, the IP address of your machine, colon, 60443. Type in the username and password, Mac and Mac, just like you've used to set up the Deploy Studio server, and click Connect, and you should be there. Oh, see, what we found over here is yeah, if it did unexpectedly quit, right quit, it does seem it to actually save the settings. Up. You're trying to do the, sh the FP share, and that's not. It just wants like the web address. It, it is. So you do HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon and uh, nope nope colon. No, no DS either. Like you're trying to. There you go, sixty or six hundred eighty, and then Mac Mac. There you go. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's so if you've correctly configured your Deploy Studio server and correctly con connected to one of them, you should see this. Oh, it might have already configured. Zero it activity. HTTPS. Four workflows, five scripts, zero packages, zero masters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can play around in there if you want, but this isn't incredibly helpful to you until you can get another machine to access yeah, this server. So, settings for each Brandon's each. gonna take over here in a minute and talk about NetBooty machines, but until, while he's helping, you can connect to your partners or your neighbors Deploy Studio server. Ask them for their IP address. Open up a new window. Deploy Studio admin, server, connect to server. Ask them for their IP address. Everybody's using the same username and password, and you should be able to connect. See, I told you, expect it. You can also connect to the server up here, which is 192.168.2.3. Yep, a few times. Yeah. If you want the person to f who's netbooting to find the server, you're going to be the client, and you want to find the IP address of the server and type that into the Deploy Studio admin. Oh, I'm sorry. You need a new window. Click uh, server and connect to server. So we're going to connect to a different server. You can connect to multiple servers in the Deploy Studio admin at the same time. 
when you, when you ask it to connect to a new server, that's when we get the IP address. Mac. You could connect the five down if you wanted to. Mac, Mac admin. If, 192, if you want to connect to this server up here, the central server we set up, it's 192.168.2.3. Uh, two. The username, the username is Mac. The user password is Mac admin. Mac, Mac admin. You connect. If you, the port is if you configured it for SSL, it's uh, 6443. If you didn't do SSL, it's 680. So when, if you've connected to your neighbor, have your, the neighbor who is the administrator click on workflows. Do you guys know if once you set it up for SSL, you always have to connect to SSL, or can you connect non-standard? I think you it's, have to you connect have to with SSL. SSL. Yes, it only runs the web service on that port. Um, if you see workflows, have your administrator change the name of a workflow, and then check the other admin, see if it updates. You might have to hit F5, Command R, one of those. Click all, actually what I found with the admin is if you click off of workflows and back into it, it'll most likely refresh at that point. I was wondering about that. So it, I'm not gonna go too in depth into workflows right now because Nathan's gonna take over that in a little bit. But does everybody, everybody connecting to an admin, to a server, either local or neighbor or central up here? Great, okay. Okay, so for NetBoot, which is the majority of how people are going to want to run this, because you're probably going to want to do labs or multiple machines, uh, we're going to go through that now. This, we're assuming, is just 10.7 server, which I don't think you guys can actually run through. They can't, can they? They can't actually walk through this part, can they? They can, it's just... Um It'll get you guys, confusing. Well, you guys can follow along, but the point where it's actually trying to, to set up the NetBoot services, we're going to have you guys skip because we don't need... Third yeah. NetBoot servers? We'll, we'll have one, the one up right. here. Clients don't have server installed, they don't have server admin installed, so you won't be able to use those tools. Okay. Right. So because you guys don't have server, you won't. there's two steps on here you won't be able to do. But just so you guys do know as a, as a note, let me turn my mic back on, um, is that you guys can set up just an OS X client to be a Deploy Studio repository. It will, on the clients, they have the ability to do NetBoot, they just don't have the nice server interface for it. But Deploy Studio's um, wizard to configure it will set up the services in the background for you and allow you to actually NetBoot from them. So, but we're not gonna have you guys do that because we don't need you all NetBooting and flooding the traffic on the, the network, so. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if, uh, when I go through it, if it'll ask, actually ask me with this being server, it may, in which case I'll mention it at that point. But it's when you run through the assistant, which I'm going to do now, when you do that on client, it'll say, hey, would you like a DHCP server? Hey, would you like a NetBoot server? And so we'll get to that. Okay, so we'll minimize all this. I know he had server open at some point. Basically what you wanna do is on your 10.7 uh, server, um, it's actually not in server anymore. Oh well, lots of servers. Um, where's the admin, there's the admin. All right, this actually already has NetBoot on, but NetBoot is very easy. Uh, when you, you actually want, if you're in 10.7, you want to open up the server admin. If you're in 10.6, that's all you, most people really use. Um, you wanna to go to settings and then services, and then just check the NetBoot service and then hit save. And at that point, it'll come up over here. Um, when you click on it, you have a whole bunch of settings in here. I think it actually defaults here to overview. Um, It'll give you some status, the last time it started, the last time the client updated, yada, yada, yada. Give you some other stats here too. Um, basic, simple information. Log, if you're having some issues, this is where you can at least see stuff from the server side. Connections, um, you'll see that once we start booting clients, this will fill up quite quickly. This will show you the host name, IP address, and all that kind of stuff of booted clients. These are clients that have already booted onto the system. 
And then within settings here, you can enable NetBoot on at least one port. So if you have, for example, like a Mac Pro or something like that that has two uh, Ethernet ports, you can enable it just on one and leave your other one open or enable it on both or however you want to do that. Um, the images and client data down here, typically, at least what I've found, is you always want to just check both boxes for whatever volume you set it up for. Um, this will default to slash library slash netboot, net client slash whatever on any volume you put it on. So if you put it on another volume and it doesn't have a slash library, it's going to create it. So, but it's always in that specific path on any volume that you pick. Um, especially now, like as you can see here, SSD, the client data and images, you can separate it so you can get more speed, like say serving out the images, but then once the clients are up and going, it'll store stuff. This, the client data is not relevant to um, deploy studio. The client data is more so when you have kind of like a thin client setup. So images, this is where it lists all the images that you have. So that's turning on NetBoot. Once you turn it on, we're good at that point. So now what you want to do is actually go back through, and you guys can actually follow along with this part, um, is you want to open back up the deploy studio assistant. So go back into utilities, and you can open up the assistant. Just double click it. So instead of setting up the Deploy Studio server, we are going to create a, net, or a Deploy Studio netboot set. Basically configuring Deploy Studios through this utility. Yeah, we, yeah let's run this off real quick. So when you click on that, hit continue, It'll say a couple of different things. Um, basically, it's to configure its own netboot environment just kind of says stuff with that. Um, and as it says here, don't forget to create your NetBoot system on the latest Mac system that you have. If you happen to, I think you guys just ran into this, if you get the latest yep. iMacs from Apple, they have a different build than the 1073 that's out there right now. Yeah, they have, yeah, that's the newest 21 and a half inch iMacs have a special build. Of, no. Those are the i3s? The i3s, the i3s, correct. Only the i3s. The rest of the line is okay. But so whatever your highest build is, you want to do it on that machine at the time that you have it. If you end up getting, say, a new lab coming in, check to see if it's a newer build. If it's a newer build while the machine's on, go and you can plop the uh, assistant on the machine and then run this utility to create your netboot. You can do this on any machine. It doesn't have to be on the server. It can be on a random client. I usually create it on my MacBook and then upload it to the server. A side note to that is if you have a mixed environment, I keep doing this. You have a mixed environment of 10.6 and... Thank you, Warong. Sorry, is that working now? Okay. If you have a mixed environment of 10.6 and 10.7, um, it's generally good to kind of boot your 10.6 machines with a 10.6 netboot and your 10.7 machines with a 10.7 netboot. So all you have to do is take your client, install Deploy Studio Admin, and run just this portion of it that'll create the netboot set for you. It'll dump it on your desktop. You can AFP into your server and generally what I do is actually share the netboot folder and just drag it from the desktop into your netboot folder on your server and then it'll show up in your server uh, admin list for the netboot. And that way, and then usually I, I typically set the 1073 netboot to be the default. Um, he'll show you in a little bit, there's a little radio button to set them to the default. And that way, uh, when you guys, you'll see this in a little bit, when you hold down option and they show up, you can choose 106 or 107. Um, and then ideally also in the OS, you can choose your startup disk, which if you guys have, uh, have it on the local subnet or the IP helpers, it'll show up within uh, OS 10 for you, which again, we'll show you in a little bit. So the system name, you can name it whatever you want. I usually do a format of uh, DSR, which typically stands for Deploy Studio Runtime, uh, dash the build. So if I'm doing RC131B, I'd put RC131B. If I'm doing nightly build, uh, NB, and then whatever the date is of the nightly build, and then dash, and then the time that I made it. So I kind of have you know fine grain of all that kind of stuff. For the sake of clarity here, I'm just going to do uh, DS session, I guess. Uh, I would uh, add maybe server to it so we know which one it is. Okay. For, uh, aside from everyone else's, I also what I like to do with this system separate set is add the unique identifier into the name too, because if that unique identifier is over four thousand nine hundred ninety something, 
it'll be able to load balance between multiple servers. And then and that, when I create a new Netboot set, I increase that ID number by one. And that's Netboot servers, not Deploy Studio servers. Correct, thank you. Um, the network uh, language, you can leave current. You can pick a couple different languages, like how they have specifically Canadian French in there. Um, network time server, this is mostly used for when you do the binding stuff. So if you have an internal time server, especially with AD, set it to that. Uh, most time servers aren't too far off, but do whatever you normally set your system to. So I'll just leave it standard. Um, here, this tells you where you want to connect to. Um, you can use the Bonjour to discover available servers, um, in which case it'll just, if you have it all set up correctly, it'll just find your server on the network. But I recommend specifying the server. Um, that's what I'm going to do here, just make it actually connect back to this one. And even if you specify a specific server, when you get into runtime, you can type in a different address. So it's not forcing you into this address. You can put, uh, it doesn't matter what IP, you can put your neighbors, you don't want, you probably don't want to use your IP, although you know what, it doesn't matter because we won't be using it. Yeah, these, mach your machines aren't going to be acting as a netboot server, so you can just cancel this once it gets to like the final step of actually creation, because it actually takes a couple minutes, so. Um, but basically you, sorry, what? Yes, whatever your server is, you put it in. Yes. So, if, so I was just going to say, I, I highly recommend actually putting in a DNS name on your local mm -hmm. networks because I hate getting burned by static IP addresses in configuration files. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so in your production, this is going to be the address of your Deploy Studio server. Yeah, and the preferred, put it in there if you only have one. The uh, alternative is starting to get into, like, if you have replicas and that sort of thing or more than one, but for now, just do one. We'll go with that. So you put in the proper field. Is the capital HTTPS? Okay. I, I'm assuming so. I can change it. You had caps lock on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whatever. All right. So this part you don't have to fill out, but if you want to automate deploying labs, it's recommended because you can automate the tasks. Um, basically, the default login is whatever login you want to have the runtime log into the server as. So in my case, I typically have a DS runtime user um, that I put in this. So then this way, when it, you'll see when we netboot it, it'll come up into a login process. This will automatically go in. In some situations, you might not want that. If you can't protect your netboot and you're just going to have students <laughs> randomly netbooting your machines, it's going to automatically log in. You may not want that. Uh, in yeah. which case, leave a blank. I suggest if this is anywhere on a network that anyone else besides you can get to, don't auto log in at first. Um, the other nice thing that they added here is, as you can see, there's an ARD user and password. Um, if you don't put the username in and just put a password, it's VNC, so then you can use any client to connect. Um, and I think you can still do it anyway if you also put a username. But now you can actually use ARD to remote to your client machines while they're net booted to either control them or to, if you get errors, you can fix the errors and that sort of thing. Or just to see the status. Another. A tip I have about this is, like he was saying, at least put in a, a password for the most part, because um, we can show you again later. There's a function built into Deploy Studio Admin where you can click a little icon and it'll allow you to control the machine while it's in the runtime. Um, so it'll show up in the activity within Deploy Studio Admin. You click Control, it'll automatically launch the screen sharing app built into OS 10, and then you just have to punch in the password, and you can. This way, it's for remote stuff. If you have a computer in three buildings that are you know, half a mile away, it's a lot better to you know, kind of have remote access than have to truck over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, I kind of want to keep moving on. So the other options here, the log, when you actually do it, it'll display the log in the background over whatever background you have. If you don't want that for security reasons or for whatever not, you can uncheck it so then you don't actually have the log running in the back and you can open it up separately. Um, to put the display to sleep after 10 minutes is the default. That's just when your screen goes off. Um, and then the last one, and obviously these are all optional. Uh, the quit runtime automatically after 30 seconds of inactivity. If your task fails, you have 30 seconds to run around your lab and hit OK. <laughs> um, what I typically do is put in 120 seconds. So I have two minutes to be able to go around my lab of 25 machines if it fails and then hit OK that it still stays in the runtime when it fails. Otherwise, it's going to reboot on me, and then possibly I can't get them back. If I don't have netboot enabled on that subnet, 
then the only way to do it is we had bless command and it may have already reset what the default boot is and then your SOL wouldn't have to take it to a subnet or image it some other way. So I'll just change it to 120 here just for fun. And by the way, the username and password I put here is just Mac Mac. It's independent of anything else. That's just what you want. If you have an ARD user that you use on your image, I recommend it being the same because then you can just open up ARD with your current groups and just connect as you normally would. Hit continue, and then some other options. If you have some scripts that you do that need Python or Ruby, this is where you want to check them. I don't have any of those, so I've never really checked them. I generally always check them because they're small enough mm -hmm. that I don't care. And if I do need Python or Ruby in the future, I don't have to recreate my netboot set. Um, I'll go ahead and select them. Just okay. <laughs> the custom stack, I guess some people are having problems with um, network performance. I have checked it occasionally, haven't really noticed a different either, difference either way. Um, disable wireless support, obviously you don't want to do this if you're netbooting errors. Because <laughs> you won't be able to connect anything. Um, you, but, can't, you can use the same netboot for the Airs, Mac Pros, iMacs, as yeah. long as the driver, the uh, combo update covers those machines. Yeah, it's the same thing like if you do a Golden Master, when you do like combo updates and stuff, you want to do that with this too. Um, disable ads, uh, it is now ad supported when you're in your runtime, there's little ads that pop up on the bottom. I personally don't fault them for this because I have tried many times to get my management to put in our budget to donate to them and they never have. So we're basically using a free piece of software. So I don't blame them for trying to you know, cover the cost of everything. But if you need to, I know when it first popped out, there were some not so school friendly ads that were coming through, which they have since fixed, but you can disable that. Yeah. So. And I'm not sure how the ads work because once you're in the runtime, if you click that ad, you're not really going anywhere. Yeah. Safari's not installed. Yeah. If you have a web browser, it'll open it up. And if you don't have internet access, it's not gonna go out either. So. No. Um, if you want a custom title on the netboot, you can put that there. And if you have a custom background, like I saw Nate has on uh, some screenshots with his, he's got like the, the you know the standard school logo background that you can put there. And those are really nice for branding when your you know administrators say, "What is this tool? Look, it's got our pictures on it." Yeah, and you can also with the custom title, you can put like a version in if you're concerned about that. Um, and then this is where to put it. Um, it defaults to the default location of just slash library netboot when you enable it. Um, you can locate it if you have it on a different volume and then go out to those folders and plop it there. Or you can pick your desktop, like if you're making it on your MacBook and your server's out there. You can select it on your desktop so then it will create it on your desktop and you can copy that out. Right, for you guys, this is defaulting right now to your desktop because you guys are on clients. Um, so it is kind of, it's got logic built into it that if you're on a server, it'll dump it in the netboot folder for you. If you like you guys, if you're on a client, it'll dump it on the desktop for you because um, they're anticipating that you're building it on a different OS than the server has. So that way it makes, they try and make it easy for you so you can get the NBI and just throw it on your server. Um, I've heard of people trying to create netboots directly to a sh server share as well. And I've heard mixed results on that. Sometimes it fails. So what I suggest is save it locally to your desktop first and then move it to the server. Uh, these options here are pretty self-explanatory. If you only have a netboot server for Play Studio, you can go ahead and make it your default and delete all the existing ones that are already out there. Unless I'm not going to do that. Uh, 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 you can delete all your old netboot sets, unless maybe you want to roll back to a previous version of Deploy Studio. So maybe make a backup. They're not incredibly large uh, files, netboot sets. So I think they're less than a gig. Yeah, so leaving them there and just disabling them or making a backup and moving them out of the way is sometimes preferable too. And keep, always keep your Deploy Studio server installer or download. Uh, and the other thing is, is uh, I've already seen a couple of you do it. Don't click continue oh, because it's going to start trying to create the netboot set for you and the only way to get out of it is to force quit Deploy Studio. Oops. Just Mac, yep. So at this point, I ask you for admin username and password. Hit OK. My lowercase Mac. Does it matter? Yeah, I think if it's using short name. And then it'll spin and spin and spin and spin. And you'll see also here on the desktop, you'll have different DMGs that mount. Basically, it creates a, a sparse bundle and then throws different things in it. So you might see that pop up on your desktop as it's going. Don't do anything with it as it's going. It took about a little over five minutes, I think, to do on these laptops when we tested it. What's that? Yeah. Okay, so 
at this point, uh, we could probably start getting them net booting because yeah, we, we don't need to use a specific net boot set. We don't. So. Yeah. So we we've already created a net boot set and installed that on the server. So we don't have to wait for this to complete. In fact, if you want to force quit, I'm fine with that. Okay. So if you guys want, yeah. um, one of the other things you can do is I now, because of BSDP um, and NetBoot and all that magic that they have going on in the background, if you guys open up your uh, system preferences, you guys can, uh, I don't know if you can do it on the server, but uh, you can go into system preferences and there's a startup disk yep. uh, preference pane. To. I don't know if it'll find itself or not. but Yeah, I don't know if it'll find itself. That'd be cool. Yeah, startup disk, and then. Do, 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 yeah, it doesn't do, look do. like it'll find itself. Nope, apparently not. Correct. Oh, no, there should be a DSR 1073. That's the netboot we created earlier. Uh, if you guys want to go ahead and select that and hit restart, and you guys will all magically netboot to the Mac Mini sitting yep. on the table. So they have DSR 1073 set up. Right. Hey, Cindy or Jay? They're not paying attention to us. We're insignificant. Oh. Yeah, we're going to show um, you that too. Yeah, if you reboot your machine and as it bongs, you can hold down the uh, option key. And uh, with these, with being newer machines, it'll actually ask you which netboot set you want to pick from. You can also hold N, which will default to the default netboot set or the previous one that it used. The advantage of that is then it, it's not set to go to the, uh, to the uh, network. Because being the system preferences, it, it's now set. Yes. To yeah. always go to system preferences, and you have to go and change it back, whereas the uh, holding option, it's at one time. It, it depends, because in your workflows, you can if you're imaging a disk, you can set it to do uh, the default disk back to whatever you image, so then that kind of... But if all you're doing is going in to install packages, then yes, that makes sense. Right. Um, Crap, what did I just mention? <coughs> I had something I want to say, and now I, now I don't remember it. How do I get into this ad? Yeah. Oh, the ad? I, so just if you really want to know about Rackspace, huh? They're just going to pay the display. It's, it's basically Google AdWords. So when they pop up, they get a certain amount for that. And I, I'm not sure if you click it, if they actually get more for it or not. <laughs> I really don't know. But. Possibly, yeah. Um, but again, if you don't have internet access, it's not going to work. So. I can't download my free 30 playing ad. I'm surprised they're popping up already. When I first tried it to see it, it took forever for an ad to come up. <laughs> see, at least they're kind of relevant. OK, so at this point, it looks like most people are up to the uh, runtime login screen. Is this a correct assumption for most people? Yes? If you notice it booted fairly quick, it all depends on your network. Um, I have 25 machines that I tell, oh, that's what I want to mention. You can tell it to net boot uh, over ARD using the bless command. It's out there. If you search for uh, ARD net boot bless or something like that, I'm sure it'll come right up. Um, but I push that out with my labs, and then all the machines go back to whatever server I tell it to and boots them. So. Yes. The, well, um, the script that well the script I use bless has a next only command, so it'll only net bless it to netboot the one time, and then, as we were saying earlier, uh, certain workflows will actually automatically set it to boot back to the first available disk. Um, but otherwise, we're gonna have to show you this anyways because you're all booted into it already. Once you guys are logged in, there's a utilities folder, and you can change your startup disk again back to Macintosh HD. Yeah, the other thing you can do is if you use the bless command, you can add, I think it's dash dash next only, which will only do for the next boot. Right. So that's one way of doing it too. I kind of made a hack together scriptish kind of bash thing that tried to determine the hard disk and set it back to default. And it works most of the time. Though. So log in, Mac, Mac admin, because you're talking back to the box here. Please don't run anything. <laughs> There's no images on there, so you can't re-image re them, but they will take an image. All right, so for, go ahead. Menu, there's some utilities that's already defaulted. Could you add utilities into that? Yes. yes. And how easy is that? Um, I believe when you create the netboot, 
you want to, if you actually go into the file it creates, it creates a .nbi file. When you, you can actually go into that, I think you have to do a show package contents. And when you go into that, there's the sparse bundle, which is basically DMG. You open that up, and then it may even just be applications utilities. Yep. Or is it just that? I, I didn't so. know. If, I thought one time it was like under the admin. I, I, I think they've changed it now. Okay. It's been a while since I've played with it. But yeah, it's just a matter of taking the dot app and throwing it in yep. the, the app. So if you wanted Firefox on there where you could click ads, you can just shove it in the applications <laughs> folder. <laughs> yep, there's been plenty. That's actually one reason that people ask us to throw things like Disk Warrior and that kind of stuff in. All right, we're down to 20 minutes, so to get you guys continued on with this, um, I'm not going to actually show you anything in the runtime right now, but it does show you that once, uh, once you have workflows within your Deploy Studio admin, this is where you go. Um, I can show you an example. So install a package. If, uh, within the workflow I'm going to show you later, you can check a box for automate or not to automate. Uh, if you do not define a package and you do not define to automate, uh, all your packages that are in your repository will actually be listed here. Um, so this is one way you can kind of do self-service is through access groups, you know, your users have access to certain packages within the repository, so they can boot into this and see the list of packages and kind of self-serve and install their own thing. Go what? I have a package. You did? Oh. Yeah, if this is kind of an iTunes interface, so you can hit back and forward. The only problem is if you go forward and it does a task and fails and you hit back, it doesn't actually undo that task. Yeah. The other thing is uh, Command R helps uh, refresh the screen. So you guys can see here that we have the deploy. I'm not going to run it right now, but this is, just gives you an idea. Uh, it'll start listing all the packages that are in your repository. And so I'm going to. The other thing that you guys have to do, as the gentleman had pointed out, because we chose our startup disk within OS. If we were to reboot right now, it would just go right back to Netboot. So what I need you guys to do is go up to Utilities, and there's an op there's a utility for startup disk. And I just need you to change the boot system back to Macintosh HD and hit restart, and that'll boot you back into Lion for us. Bong. I should hold the mic up to it. <laughs> the Apple Overlord. <gasps> Anyone have any questions so far? Yes. Or if you don't have a wired NIC. You see your machine doesn't have a? Yeah. So there's two things to do when you have a bunch of MacBook Airs. You can buy a USB dongle to Ethernet and boot them that way. Or you can try and boot them over the air, over the Wi-Fi. When you boot up, option to boot a MacBook Air, it'll give you an option for which wireless you want to join. I've done it. Uh, well, I, honor, so when I ran Deploy Studio at my desk, I had a private network that I ran similar to this. So my server ran one cable back to my desk, and it had DHCP for me. Off of that cable, I ran an airport. Inside that, you know, the, the four-port airport switch, the older style, I could do my, e, my wired clients right there, and then if I wanted to do wireless, I could do it off that single airport. So I wasn't touching the rest of the, the network. Yeah. Yep. I, it would make it would be worthwhile if you're doing um, over like ten MacBook Airs and you need to do them really quickly to talk to John Detroit about how to do it in thirty six seconds for a nine gig image. Yeah, so what he did was he took uh, an, an external Thunderbolt SSD hard drive and he installed an OS onto that hard drive and booted the MacBook Air to it. And he was able to restore a 9 gig image with um, Casper's uh, imaging suite in 36 seconds. It was very fast, but no, as you do the setup on here, one of your options is to create an external bootable drive to do imaging through the Play Studio. Yes. So yeah, so Deploy Studio has, has, as he's mentioned, an external drive option or USB drive option. And what that is, is it's the netboot installed on an external drive. That's pretty much all it is. You boot into that netboot from an external drive. And then you can connect to the server. You can also... Correct, yep. Yeah. You can also use a fully boot, uh, full OS and install the admin tools and create that in uh, netboot or an external hard drive in case you need more 
uh, troubleshooting tools within it. Yeah, that's a, when we set for either network, there's also the local share, or it doesn't say local share, but there's a local option in network SharePoint. That local option is what will get you one hard drive. Can you use uh, Jamf's new uh, NetSus utility that? Yes. Okay. Wait, okay. <laughs> to NetBoot. To NetBoot. Um, and then if you have your SIFs on a, or if you have your repository on a SIF share, oh, could be another Linux box someplace, can you break the dependency on having a X server Mac Mini completely? You cannot, sadly. Um, you can break out the NetBoot section, which I believe uh, Jamf's NetBoot will work with that. There, I think there were some issues at the very beginning, but I think that's been corrected. Um, and then obviously oh. you can connect back. It's still not working? There's like what? tons oh. of ants on here. No, no. sorry, sorry. There's tons of ants on this thing, sorry. No. Um, and then um, the you can connect back. I think in the line, SIFS is broken. So still, maybe? Say, say that again? With a, with a Lion net boot, I think SIFS is still broken to connect back to that's for correct. the repository. So, yeah. I mean, you still need to need, uh, you need a Mac to host the actual Deploy Studio server binaries. However, if you want to host everything else elsewhere, you can. You can use Netatalk for AFP coming from a Linux box or uh, Extreme ZIP for a Windows box. And you can, if you can, you, if you can host the NetBoot image from Jamf's NetSus uh, VM, or some folks have even made it work on Windows. I'm not exactly sure how. Um, but you still need a Mac somewhere in there to host the Deploy Studio server software itself. But that could just easily be a laptop. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't need to be heavy duty. Right. Okay, Nate. And of course, if you have any other questions, yeah. you can just see us here. Okay, so uh, we're down to about 14 minutes, so I'm going to blow through this. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand. Um, activity here, uh, I'm just going to kind of go over the Deploy Studio admin interface. Um, so if you would like to open up yours uh, and connect to your local repository and follow along, you're more than welcome to. Um, activity, as you can see here, with all of you net booting into this server, um, this will let you know kind of some simple information about the computer. Earlier I had mentioned about the VNC password. That's what this little uh, kind of cursor with some waves on it is. If you click that, it'll open up screen sharing and you can type in that password and it'll allow you to VNC into that machine. It's kind of all built into Deploy Studio and OS X. It was Mac Mac if you want to show them. If anybody needs help, just raise your hand. We'll come around. It's the little arrow thing that they have right here, yeah. So, uh, and this gives you some feedback about what's going on with the machine, yeah. Um, what's that? The blue. That opens no, up the that, log. That just kind of lets you know that it's a, P, a Mac. It, it's blue if it's a Mac. It shows. It says PC if it's a PC, I believe. It's got a couple different icons. If if you want to use Deploy Studio admin and connect to this server, you can just using the IP and Mac Mac admin, yeah. and follow along with the activity. The status over here on the right-hand side will actually kind of show you the status of the workflow steps. Uh, right now, there's only a blue one. That means that it's currently working on workflow task one. Uh, later on, if I have enough time, I'm going to show you my repository from production. Uh, and it can get very big very quick. And as tasks are completed successfully, you'll see one, two, three, so on and so forth. It'll start turning them green to let you know that that task completed successfully. Uh, also, here's the computer database. Uh, as you guys, uh, we were showing you earlier with the reject uh, computers, uh, if you have that enabled, they won't connect to Deploy Studio's runtime unless they're in this database. Um, so typically, you leave that off, or you only leave it off long enough to populate this database. Uh, otherwise, you have to manually add computers into it. Uh, within this database, uh, it has a, a bunch of options, and to be honest, I don't use any of these. There's all sorts of different ways to utilize Deploy Studio. The only thing that I typically do use in here is you can automatically set up a workflow. So if you have a NetBoot set that automatically logs in to your Deploy Studio runtime, you can have that computer automatically, say, install a package. You know, it, these are just the names of the workflows that are listed over here. Yeah, revert. That are listed over here. So if you want a fully automated system, say you have a, a workflow to re-image the lab, you can have a netboot set for the whole lab that automatically logs in, and you can actually set up groups as well. So for example, we can say uh, you know, lab, and then I can take these first five computers, throw them in lab, and in automation I can say um, you know, 
restore a master, and then save that. And what that'll do is you can apply it to all the members of that group. So if you have an entire lab that you want to run a specific workflow automatically, that's how you would do it. And then that way when they automatically netboot, they automatically start imaging. And as long as your workflow is set up properly, they'll automatically reboot and hopefully be ready to use by the users. Any questions on that? No? Any I was going to say afterwards about a pro tip with this. Okay. Um, custom properties, again, if I have enough time, um, Rusty helped uh, kind of keep along a, uh, a bash uh, script for warranty information about Max. Um, within the workflow, there's actually um, com not command lines. They're like variables, variables I guess. Like you, you echo out uh, a certain command within the workflow or within the runtime, and you can actually set key variables in here. But you can also set them within the Play Studio admin. Um, so. You know, for this is a bad example, but you could say, "Hey, this computer is a laptop." So, as one of your workflows, you could go through and you know have it check for that variable that it's a laptop and install VPN or something like that. Um, you know, sky is kind of the limit on this. You can configure it and uh, customize it as much as you want. Uh, accounts is another key one. If you uh, are using local accounts, um, typically what I'll do is uh, I still like to have a, a, a local admin. Um, on some computers, and I typically have them hidden so that the students can't try and play with it at all. Um, you can create as many local admin or local accounts as you want. You can make them admin or not. Um, but in my school, we're now trying to go to 100% uh, directory services, so we no longer are doing that. That's um, also it also saves a password and a reversible hash. So I like to use the create user package or create line user package as an alternative to creating users. Correct. Uh, so the meat of this, uh, the meat of the Play Studio is uh, the workflows. Um, these are the basic four that always come with it. Um, it's very simple to create workflows. Um, this doesn't have my snapping on it that I'm used to. Um, you can hit the little plus sign, and then you hit this plus sign here next to drop tasks. And this little green plus within OS comes in handy for that because it kind of resizes everything for you. Um, actually, a note about that uh, real quick. Yeah, I've actually I've had my co-ops turn happen with this a lot. If you have this full screened, and then you go plus and nothing happens, it's because it's popping out over the edge. So that little green plus sign will save your bacon a lot. And I have so many co-ops that have that happen to me. Um, oh, I got people connected to my repository. Um, okay, I'm like, I didn't make those. Nice job, great workflows. Um, so right now there are 22 workflow task options over here on the right hand side. Um, one of the ones I'm going to show you, and I don't have, I'm going to cheat for a second here. Uh, oh, I'm connected to the other server, that's why. Uh, scripts. It's on the root of the hard drive. Oh, Xcode. No. Whatever. Oh, I don't want to install that. OK, I'm not going to cheat right now then. Uh, quick look. Oh, can I do that? Yep. How do I do a quick look? Space. Just space. Oh. I can't copy, though. <laughs> uh, no. Sorry. OK. Anyways, <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to skip that part. Um, but basically, uh, something as simple as uh, taking a disk image, um, which is already what this create a master volume is, um, you just drag and drop. Uh, I don't really have a preset way of doing this. That's, that's uh, new user form. Yeah, where's that's, that? Uh, left, left one. So let's say we want our oh, technicians to create a new user. This will give them the option to add a new user. Let's say we want them to install a package. Yeah. They can either choose a package to install, or we can tell them exactly which package to install, and they don't get a choice. Uh, from that first screen, that new user form, that'll ask the person for the username, password, et cetera. In the runtime, it'll the actually run pop up with a form that you can fill in information. And what that's actually doing is, is coming into the, the, the computer object uh, in the database and adding to this accounts field. Anytime you uh, have something like you know, new user form, don't you also have to drop in configure so it actually applies? Like drop in the configure. Yes. Tab. Yes, you do. Thank you. Oh, yes. So the, he makes a good point. So uh, in your workflow, if you're asking it to make a new user, if you want that new user to actually be applied to the image that you're, you're pushing out, you have to run the configure computer right here. 
So in this configure computer, there's a create local users option. And what that does is any of, the any of the users that you have within the database object, the computer database object, that's when it gets created, is by checking that task within the workflow. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this because I'm down to five minutes, but uh, basically just play in a production, or not a production. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sorry. why not, right? Play as much in as production. you can in a testing environment. It's, uh, um, there are a lot of options for the 22 different tasks. Uh, some of them have no options like create new user, but others have multiple checkboxes and whatnot. Um, and try and get on the Deploy Studio forums. I'm on there a lot. I get Google Reader all the time, anytime there's a new post. Um, so I'm, the, many of us are on there, so we're all willing to help if you have any questions. You see that icon at, uh, at the bottom? It's like a wireless uh, yeah. button. What does that do? I've never figured that out. That? Next to the plus and minus, it's got that wireless fan that Nate just yeah, covered. Sorry, do you? <laughs> right here. Yeah. Right I was trying to add a mask. Yeah. Right here. I've never that, used it. Don't know. It's new. That, what that actually is, is if you wanted to, like say if you had your NetBoot clients up, and something, I think this is what the purpose is. I know what it does, I'm just not sure why it's there. Um, if you have clients and like say something failed, that will force uh, ASR to start a multicast session or to get that, well, yeah, multicast to get an image out. So when you select that and hit that, it'll fire up ASR, which is what it uses in the background to do the multicast to start getting an image out there. So like say for example, if you had a NetBoot set that uses NetRestore, you, or you created your own and just want to use ASR, you can hit that to start the image being available on the server that clients in, can connect to to pull from. I'm guessing so. That's why I said I'm not really sure like what it's actually there for in it, but that's what that, because if you go back to activity too, um, Oh, when it's you for go, multicasting. Yeah. Okay. When oh, you go sorry. back to activity, you'll see uh, if you're actually imaging, you'll see all your clients, and you'll also see one that's got the name of your master, and it'll have that same logo on it. So does anyone have any questions about the workflows? So that's where you, when we talked about the user home backup scripts, Yes. drop those in first. Yeah. The sort of the first task is you're, you're going to back up there. Correct, correct. Yeah, we, the backup restore scripts for backing up and restored users, they're split into two, a backup script and restore script. Run the backup script first, and then after you've imaged a client, then you do the restore scripts. And are you doing the AD binding within this piece, or do you do that? Within this piece, yeah. That's one of the options that you can drag over is AD binding and OD binding. Right. Yep. What happens on a, like, you re-imaging machine? Mm -hmm. so it's already been imaged, it's already been bound. It'll just overwrite the object. Yes, it overwrites the computer object and the bind. Oh, okay. So there's not a problem with it that. Should. It should. Test. Okay. Mileage may vary, but it should just overwrite that computer record if you're using the same computer name. Yeah, see where it says computer ID? You can have it get the host name from DNS. At this point, I'd say, I think we're done. We can, and we yeah, can if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to stick around. We're just going to be hanging out for a few minutes. Thank you, everyone.